Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. Brethren in Christ, Laudetu Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. I am here on the road today in Kansas City, Kansas. I'm here at the main library doing this stream. Once again, we're continuing the Guild Family Action Plan for the Synod on Synodality every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be talking about all of your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, objections, worries, and anxieties for this momentous month of October. I had the immense blessing to visit the relics of Sister Wilhelmina in Gower, Missouri, uh, not too far here from Kansas City. And that was on Wednesday, and it was just indescribably remarkable. If anyone has the opportunity to go to see her relics, it's really quite just amazing. It's unspeakably remarkable. It's hard to even put it into words, the experience of encountering a saint literally in the flesh, right there before your eyes, miraculously incorrupt. And it's just amazing. So I uh, hope you all have a chance to go. It certainly is gives gave me a great, great spiritual uh, encouragement, excitement. Um, I, that morning I was actually feeling quite sick. I had the Tuesday night, I hadn't slept well the night before I was feeling sick and just kind of generally grumpy. And, uh, then I came in and just saw sister Lamina's relics and it was just like, this is awesome. And it's just a great day to be a Catholic. It's a great time to be a Catholic. We live in this time where we have this new saint and, uh, it's really amazing. So it's a glorious time to be a Catholic. There's so much to be grateful for. I, we, we just released a, a conversation between myself and Cavazos um, over at 1 Peter 5. And in that, I, I read from the biography of Sister Lamina, numerous aspects of it. Um, and the aspect about Sister Lamina that I like the best is her virtue of eutropelia, virtue of affability. Um, this this um unconquerable virtue of hope yeah alex says uh your video yesterday was awesome glad, glad to hear it alex um yeah it's just this this uh, this great joy that she exudes as, as she grows older and she's writing this poetry and it's just uh a wonderful she's a wonderful wonderful saint for our times and uh so it's a very very exciting time to be a catholic and uh so sister Wilhelmina, let me let me try to tighten this mic stand here. Um, hopefully that'll st stay in place here for the duration of the stream. So today we're going to be talking more about the Dubia text. We, we went into the most controversial aspect of it last week about slavery. We dealt it, went deep into this, um, all of the citations and the, Further argumentation of both of this stream and the stream last are all in my book, City of God versus City of Man, where we talk about the history and the question of slavery in particular. You can't actually look at that, um, the real issues of slavery, um, and really look at it in depth. <laughs> you can't really do that publicly. It's like it's like it's like about as bad as talking about the Jews. You can't even talk about these things without. Um, being completely misunderstood, and it's also uh, uh, so controversial to really get at the truth of the matter that that's why we have that at the Guild Stream. So if you want the full Guild Stream, the full Guild treatment, all the controversial fullness of it, you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. And today we're going to talk about the other aspect of it, which is the question of women. And so let me just start off by reading the text of the Holy Father right here. This is where uh, the Holy Father responds to the most pertinent question in the dubia, which, of course, is the question of modernism. And we talked about this last week, how the the very essence of modernism is condemned by, by Vatican I, infallibly, in the anathema. It's also condemned by the oath against modernism, which arguably is also infallible. And the key phrase is that the, a thing has the same sense and the same understanding. And at least prima facie, prima facie, based on this paragraph that I have highlighted here, 
the Holy Father is promoting a form of neo-modernism. As I said, prima facie, meaning this, I, I could be misunderstanding what the Holy Father is intending here. So it could be that what the words here are said, it could be that the Holy Father has some other interpretation that is orthodox that I'm not aware of. But at least prima facie, on the face of it, it does appear to be neo-modernism. And the reason is, is because the presupposition of what is said here is that there are errors in the Bible. There are errors in the Bible. And this is something that I, I devoted a great deal of time in my first book on the Holy Bible to, which is the error of limited inerrancy, the concept that the Holy Bible contains errors on other things which are not having to do with salvation. And so therefore we need to change those things to update them for modern man. And that's essentially, that's one of the key, not, not the only, but it's one of the key errors of modernism is to claim that the Holy Bible is not fully inerrant, but is rather has these errors. Some of them are historical errors, but what's even worse is that the Holy Father at least appears to imply in this paragraph that the Holy Bible itself has errors in the very commandments and the moral precepts. So the first one we talked about was Exodus 21. That was about the question of slavery. And what's so terrible about suggesting that this is an error is that in Exodus 21, God himself is speaking to Moses. So we have the, the very words of God speaking to Moses. And this paragraph here by the Holy Father implies that God himself was in error. This paragraph implies that God himself was in error, which is obviously a horrendous thing to even suggest. And that's why this paragraph prima facie is neo-modernism. So today we're going to talk about the passages that he references uh, regarding woman. So, it, so in this in this whole broadcast, if you want the whole thing, like I said, you have to become a guild member. But in this whole broadcast, I'm going to argue that the Holy Bible, far from from tolerating any sort of um, denigration of woman, rather on the contrary, the Holy Bible in fact elevates woman to a very exalted state, which which takes which which actually uh, heals the fallen the fallen version of subjugating woman that you may see in for example in Mohammedanism Mohammedanism has a fallen version of subjugating woman to man that's what it, that's what the doctrines of Mohammedanism have but the holy scripture the holy bible and christianity in, in general elevates and exalts woman to an elevated state in the celestial and cosmic hierarchy of persons. So let's read this paragraph and then we're going to read the New Testament passages and that'll be at the end of the public portion that we'll delve deeply into those. So, so the Holy Father says this, he says, on the other hand, it is true that the magisterium is not superior to the word of God, but it is also true that both the text of scripture and the testimonies of tradition need an interpretation that allows us to distinguish their perennial substance from cultural conditioning. It is evident, for example, in biblical texts such as Exodus 21 and in some magisterial interventions that tolerated slavery. This is not a minor issue given its intimate connection with the perennial truth of the inalienable dignity of the human person. These texts are in need of interpretation. The same is true for some New Testament considerations on women. And we're going to look at those, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 2 and for other texts of scripture and testimonies of tradition that cannot be repeated literally today, end quote. So the key here, the key consideration here is how do you define the inalienable dignity of the human person? And what I will argue here is that God gives the dignity, God created the entire universe of angels and men. So there, there are a, a, there are three types of persons. There are divine persons, there are angelic persons, and there are human persons. Those are the three types of persons. And in obviously there, there is a sacred order of the divine persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a reason we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when we cross ourselves, and we don't say Son, Father, Holy Spirit. We don't say Holy Spirit, Son, Father. We don't mess up that order. We say it in order. 
There's also an order, a sacred order of angelic orders. There are nine choirs of angels. That's why there's a ninefold Kyrie in the traditional Roman rite. And then there's a sacred order of man and woman. And we might also add child to that order as well. And the sacred order, the term sacred order means hierarchy. Hierarchy, heroes in, in, in Greek is uh, sacred. It's an adjective. And uh, archi in Greek means the ordering, the order of something, the origin of something. Hierarchy is the sacred order. And that is what gives the dignity of persons to them. Okay. The hierarchy, the sacred ordering, everyone has their place and their special dignity within the sacred hierarchy of persons. Now, liberalism and its ugly daughters, Marxism and feminism, define dignity in a different way. And it's this presupposition which seems to undergird what the Holy Father is saying here. So we're going to get into that in the in the private portion in just a minute. But first, let's let's first read these scriptures that the Holy Father is referring to. So the first scripture is 1 Corinthians 11, 3 to 10. So here is chapter 3, and here's St. Paul says this. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Every man praying and prophesying with his head uncovered, or sorry, with his head covered, disgraceth his head. But every woman praying or prophesying with her head not covered, disgraceth her head. For it is all one as if she were shaven. For if a man be not covered, let her, if a woman be not covered, let her be shorn. But if it, but if it be a shame to a woman to be shorn or made bold, let her cover her head. The man indeed ought not to cover his head, because he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. For the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Therefore ought the woman to have a power over her head because of the angels. But yet neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, so also is the man by the woman but all things of God. And I'm going to keep on reading a little bit for context, even though this isn't exactly the portion that the Holy Father is quoting here. You yourselves judge, doth it become a woman to pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that a man indeed, if he nourisheth his hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman nourish her hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom nor the church of God. Now this I, do, this I ordain, not praising you, that you come together not for the better, but for the worst. Now, that's, first, that's the First Corinthians passage. And then the other one is First Timothy 2, 11 to 14. And that one says, that one is the sort of infamous passage about a woman shall be saved by childbearing. Now, I want to I want to note here one aspect of this is when that in one passage, the there is a an allowance and a an ordering for the sake of uh, pr women who are prophesying. That's that's the first Corinthians 11 passage. And whereas in the other one in first Timothy, there is there seems to be a disallowance for women teaching. So they're on the, on the one hand, women are prophesying with their head covers in the first passage and women are teaching or women are not teaching rather in the second passage. So this is first Corinthians two. Um, let's see, it's 11 to 14. So this is first, first Corinthians or first Timothy two, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not seduced, but the woman being seduced was in the transgression. Yet she shall be saved through childbearing if she continue in faith and love and sanctification with sobriety. So we're going to talk about all of this. Why are these passages actually not subject, subjecting or sort of subordinating and denigrating woman, but they're actually exalting woman? How can that be? 
We'll talk about that on the Guild Family stream. So if you want the full treatment, meaningofcatholic.com slash register.